Would you agree that economic activity globally has bottomed out now? So it's, it's clear that we are entering into some sort of phase two of this uh, economic episode. So there was confinement pretty much across the globe, so to diverse extent. And now we are seeing many countries reopening. But I would warn that this is going to be a very gradual process with some activities that will not reopen for a long time. You may think about restaurants, accommodation, travel, airlines. So it's going to be very slow and not, you know, the bounce back to where we were before. What do you think about the stimulus measures that we've seen thus far? How helpful have they been, Laurence? Um, could they have been better? So the, it, it has been a very impressive response from governments, as you highlight. They, they fired in all places. They supported people income. They supported business liquidity needs. They've guaranteed debt and credit. So they've done the maximum, I think, that they could do in this phase one of, of the pandemic and the economic shock that goes with it. Now we're going to enter a more difficult phase where the support will have to become more targeted so that there can be reallocation of labor and capital. So people move out of sectors that will be, uh, you know, sleeping for a long time into sector where there is labor shortages. Uh, and perhaps we're going to see that some firms have some difficulties and we also, also should help uh, entrepreneur to actually, you know, restructure where they have to restructure, close and start new business uh, wherever necessary. And Laurence, despite all of those actions taken by governments and central banks, are you concerned about permanent scarring to the global economy? And, and if you are, what, what are the scars that, uh, that you think of? So I think that's a very good, very good question. I think there are two possible uh, ways that we can look at this. The first is that some sectors will be really affected as long as we haven't found a treatment or a vaccine. And that's everything that, you know, that is um, related to social, close social relationships. So the sectors I've mentioned, accommodation, restaurants and so on, but also travel because the pandemic is everywhere. So if you want to move freely across countries, it needs to be controlled in every part of the globe. So these, these are sectors that will likely suffer for a long time. And the other thing is we, we, we will see uh, in those sectors where life will change, that uh, you know, employment will drop and there will be losses in debt. And for all of these, we will need very prompt action and support. Otherwise, we will have scars, um, especially because this can happen both in advanced economy and emerging market economies, which is unique in the, in the history of economic crisis. What kind of unintended, unintended consequences are you worried about as an economist here, Laurence? We had Michael O'Leary on Friday, and he was livid about the billions and billions of euros uh, governments were giving to their own already fiscally irresponsible before the crisis national airlines. So I think that I would say I would point to it at least three things. One is widening inequality within the countries. Um, because we know that people with lower qualifications struggle to work from home, and they usually are in those sectors that we were mentioning. It's also the case between advanced economy and emerging or developing economies that haven't got the same healthcare means and also ability to confine people because of informal work. So widening divide in the globe as well. The other is effectively um, you are seeing a lot of state support and it will be difficult to slowly remove it while maintaining competition. And a healthy competition is important, as we know, to foster innovation uh, and progress. And the third thing is obviously, uh, and this is related, uh, a lot of countries and governments are thinking about, you know, reshoring some of the activity, they're very afraid of, um, of the threat to global value chain. And here I would argue that uh, first, you know, 
it, you did global value chain for a reason, which is that it was fostering innovation and lowering consumer prices. Uh, and, and we should think about diversification and we should think about stress testing the value chain for exogenous events if we, if we fear their security. But reshoring everything will, will have a double harm, one which is to uh, fuel prices in the countries where it's reshored in some areas and the other is that it would severe the link between advanced economies and emerging market economies which have caught up uh, with the advanced economy, thanks to their participation into global production. You talk there about state support, and I've heard a number of finance ministers talking about the way that economies will be weaned off that state support at some point. When they're thinking about that, Laurence, what kind of time scale do they need to have in mind? So that's a very good question. I think there, I mean, there are several areas where you think that risks that may not have been so much considered before should be revisited today. And I would point, and they're pointing at food, they're pointing at health, they're pointing at cyber security or energy security. Um, but for all of those, uh, again, uh, you may think about a mix of having some stocks some supply chain diversification, but not necessarily, you know, being very nationalistic and protect and protectionist uh, to, to, to address these risks. You may also think that it would be perhaps helpful to have national and international security agencies that can look at this series of risks in the same body so that they can look at the, how those risks interlink and interconnect with each other. And, and governments could be better prepared to address them.